Welcome everyone. Welcome to our final session of this year's academic uh, symposium. My name is Deb Bakurjian and I will be moderating this session. Before we get started, I would like to introduce Dean Kavanaugh to share some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Deb. Uh, first, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to be with you uh, this morning as I listen and hear about some of the fantastic work you've been doing through your program and, and to get to know a little bit more about your work. Uh, as many of you know, scholarship is so important to the school, our profession. Uh, probably we would say that at no point in our history do we need bright minds coming up with some fantastic new ideas to solve real world problems. And I'm delighted that uh, the school has made um, considerable efforts to make that a central part of its work. It's also great that this is uh, interprofessional and working with communities. I think uh, the days of siloed excellence, as it was called in not so long ago, need to be put aside where we really do work intercollaboratively. And as many of you know, that really is a hallmark of the Betty and Irene Moore School of Nursing and to work with our communities. The new knowledge that we will be generating and sharing is very important as we try and improve uh, community care going forward. Um, and I know this isn't the normal way we'd like to do business um, uh, digitally like this way. I'm hoping it won't be the new norm, uh, but I just want to thank you all for working with us as we put all our all, all this effort together you've, you've, you've produced. So um, I look forward to listening to your presentations uh, and I will stop at this point. And Deb, I'm going to pass uh, over to you and good luck, everybody. Well done. Thank you, Dean Kavanaugh. <clears throat> So during this final session of our academic symposium, we will be highlighting work from some of our master's leadership students, along with our physician assistant, nurse practitioner, and master's entry program in nursing students. Our first set of speakers are nurses that are graduating from our master's leadership program. This program prepares registered nurses to step into leadership positions in their healthcare setting. Today, six of our uh, graduating MSL cohort will be sharing the results of their master's thesis, a year long scholarly project on a topic of the student's choice. Each graduate will present their project and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. Uh, you can write your questions into the Q&A box that may be located either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on what kind of device you were using. Now, our first presentation is Cherry DeMaio. Cherry's presentation is titled, The Burden of Care Across Generations, a Secondary Analysis of the 2015 AARP Caregiving in the U.S. Survey. Care, uh, Cherry's thesis chair is Dr. Janice Bell. Cherry, I'm turning it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, and my name is Cherry, and I will be presenting findings from my study, The Burden of Care Across Generations. In 2013, 40 million Americans were identified as family caregivers, providing an average of 18 hours of care per week. Often, this number is on top of a full time or part time job. Family caregivers are known to suffer from higher levels of stress, anxiety, depression, and poor health compared to their non-caregiver uh, counterparts. And concerns over their health will likely increase as the population continues to age and grow in number. It is estimated that between the years 2010 and 2030, the number of individuals aged 80 years old and older will likely increase by 79%. Meanwhile, the number of potential caregivers will only increase by 1%. This widening ratio of potential caregivers to care recipients has resulted in younger generations starting to participate in caregiving tasks. One of these generations is the focus of this study and that's the millennial generation. So this study aimed to describe the experiences of millennial family caregivers and compare their burden of care with those of their older counterparts, the Gen X and baby boomers. 
We also looked at two outcomes that we think may help impact future family caregiving policies, and those are choice in caregiving and inclusion in healthcare discussions. To achieve those aims, we uh, performed a secondary analysis of data gathered from the 2015 Caregiving in the US survey conducted by the National Alliance for Caregiving and the American Association for Retired Persons. The inclusion criteria was fairly broad and we were able to uh, include data from 1,018 caregivers. The generational cohorts were categorized according to the definitions by the NAC and the AARP. And I just want to point out that the age ranges that you see on your screen are the ages of the caregivers when the survey was conducted back in 2014. So who are the millennial family caregivers? Um, millennial family caregivers comprise 19% of the sample and on average, they were 28 years old. 59% um, of them were women and they reported caring for a grandparent, aunt or uncle. There were two key findings that I wanted to highlight in this presentation. Um, one, an alarmingly high number of caregivers in this study reported high levels of emotional strain compared with other burden of outcomes that we looked at. Um, in fact, more than 80% of caregivers in each of the generational cohorts reported high levels of emotional burden. The second is that um, there was an apparent lack of inclusion of millennial caregivers in discussions, um, healthcare discussions as it pertains to their care recipients. As after controlling for a number of variables, millennial family caregivers were significantly less likely to be included in healthcare discussions and this is also despite the fact that they were just as likely to report being the primary caregiver for their care recipients. So the results of this study um, reveal that their family caregivers experience increased levels of strain um, no matter their age. And so I think it is important that we focus our policies on ensuring the well being of our family caregivers, especially our youngest caregivers. Millennial family caregivers are expected to care for the largest generation to enter old adulthood over the next 30 to 40 years. And millennial caregivers are prob will probably care for multiple care recipients over the next three to four decades. So the opportunity here lies in addressing um, the burden of care of experienced by caregivers and address those concerns now before uh, they become burnt out or before we start seeing poor health outcomes in this population. And I think many of you will agree that there is absolute joy in caregiving, um, but that joy stems from knowing that you are supported, prepared, and not alone. So before I go, I just want to say thank you to everyone who supported me over the last two years. It's been a wonderful journey and um, I just want to say thank you. Wow, that was fantastic, Cherry. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, I wanna um, start with some questions. Um, uh, I was really struck by your slide on the ratio of caregivers and um, as the number of caregivers gets smaller and the older population gets uh, bigger, larger numbers, what do you think needs to actually change so that these older adults might get the support that they need in the future? Um, I think especially now that care is getting shifted to the homes and um, we're asking family caregivers to participate more in um, medical nursing tasks that they are they may not be prepared to do. I think it's really important that when we recognize caregivers in the healthcare setting, that we also address um, issues that they may, they may have when they um, transition to the home. So um, I think uh, we have professors here at the Family Caregiving Institute who are focusing on um, caregiver preparedness. And I think that's really important to ensure that we are uh, supporting our caregivers. 
Great. So what steps do you um, have planned um, uh, for what you might do to follow up on this research? Um, so there's going to be a lot of um, work that's going to be done uh, on, on this end. But I think when we look at 80% of caregivers who report emotional strain, even the ones that are only performing um, caregiving tasks um, in minimal hours in the week, um, I think it's imperative that we also look at why they're saying that. And it may be due to um, other uh, factors that we haven't explored yet. So I think that's something that I would want to look at. Great, I see some great re uh, research happening in your future. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I don't see any other questions at this time. So we're going to move on. Our next speaker is Eric Ernst. Eric is gonna present his study, Implementing Safety Culture at the Frontline of Healthcare. And Eric's thesis chair is Dr. Jill Joseph. Eric, the podium is yours. Thank you, Dr. Bukhojian. Uh, is my screen open? There you go, full screen. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present my thesis, Implementing Safety Culture at the Frontline of Healthcare, a toolkit for frontline leaders. Uh, I'll be utilizing the SBAR technique for communicating the information, which includes the situation, background, assessment, and recommendation. I'll then uh, go through the literature review, methods, and conclusions for the project. Uh, as we all know, healthcare is composed of a large set of interacting systems that are connected and loosely coupled by intricate networks. Patient safety emerges from safe designs used in systems that incorporate an understanding of human factors. Such an approach can improve performance, prevent harm when error does occur, and help systems to recover uh, from error and mitigate further harm. In 2000, the Institute of Medicine's report to Ares Human revealed that as many as 98,000 deaths occur each year as a result of medical error and recognized that the existing response to medical error uh, viewed errors as a sign of individual's incompetence or recklessness. Uh, this approach results in individuals being blamed for specific errors. Uh, this punitive culture of blame results in medical errors, adverse events, and near misses to go unreported. Unreported events are missed opportunities to learn from the event and use the information to improve patient safety and prevent future errors. Adverse events can negatively impact the patient and family as well as a healthcare provider. Providers who experience adverse consequences are considered the second victim of patient safety event. The first victim being the patient and family. Uh, second victims report various symptoms and consequences to well-being, including poor physical, psychological, and professional outcomes such as sleeping difficulties, burnout, reduced, reduced job satisfaction, feelings of guilt, anger, shame, as well as worries about punishment, job loss, and litigation. Uh, the Institute of Medicine's report to ARIS Unit presented a plan to guide a new approach to adverse event management, which considered individual accountability, as well as systems learning and improvement. Part four of the report, building a culture of safety, urged organizations to create an environment in which safety becomes a top priority. The Joint Commission has also recommended that leaders take the action to establish and continuously improve the five components of safety culture, trust, accountability, identifying unsafe conditions, strengthening systems, and assessment. Evidence suggests that safety culture correlates with clinical outcomes, including infection and readmission rates. Higher levels of safety culture are associated with higher safety performance and lower relative incidence of patient safety indicators. Communication openness, management support for patient safety, and non punitive response to, error, response to error are negatively correlated with patient safety indicators. Research shows that positive perceptions of safety culture may reduce second victim distress by fostering an environment that promotes effective coping after involvement in patient safety events. Successful coping increases when events are discussed openly in a non judgmental manner and can lead to destructive changes in healthcare delivery practices. Conversely, patient safety cultures that encourage environments that blame, criticize, silence, or even stigmatize patient safety events can make coping difficult, resulting in applied emotional, physical, and professional distress. 
the frontline safety culture implementation guide developed for this thesis project translates comprehensive safety culture resources into user-friendly guidelines designed for frontline leaders. The guide provides provides frontline leaders with strategies and methodologies designed to change culture surrounding response to errors from one of blame to opportunities to improve the system and prevent harm. The implementation guide provides an overview to adverse event management through the lens of safety culture, as well as guidelines for com communication and concrete action that frontline leaders can implement following an adverse event. Characteristics of the approach include components of just culture, which are psychological safety, active leadership, transparency, and fairness. Approaching adverse event management through just culture practice is a critical component to responding to safety events more effectively through improvement of reporting culture and learning culture, as well as supporting second victims. This guide can be utilized to further investigate the effectiveness of just culture practice at the front line of healthcare and may provide insights into effective incremental changes to safety culture practices within the organization. Uh, and I'd like to thank my thesis committee and of course you also Dr. Bakurjian who had a strong influence on my thesis project also through all your classes there. All right. Oh my gosh, Eric, this is fantastic. What a wonderful presentation. Of course, you know, this is one of my favorite topics. Yes. So I do have a question for you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> um, can you talk a little bit more about what is contained in the toolkit? It sounds like there's a series of um, guidelines that people can use. And then maybe as you're talking about that, can you say how people might be able to access the toolkit? Yeah, um, so the toolkit first lays out like the current approach to safety management uh, so that people have a background, like an understanding as to like why we're approaching it through just culture practices. Mm -hmm. And then it moves into uh, the like, communication behind an adverse event where uh, how do you communicate with the family? And how do you communicate with frontline staff? How do you approach individuals in a way that will encourage them to bring forward like then an event happened instead of trying to hide it and anticipating that they'll be reprimanded because of it? Uh, so the, the implementation guide like walks individuals through that process. Uh, of course, there's a your first response is you know to the, the patient, stabilize the patient. Uh, response to family it gives you guidelines on what communication would look like with the family and with the patient in terms of like um, and then also has guidelines around um, how do you have the multi-disciplinary -dis team involved in the process it's not an individual that approaches the patient during the family it's a, a team approach um, but it provides um, kind of a almost a dialogue um, like uh, format for those conversations. So it sounds like it's gonna be uh, so useful. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you outright, are you planning to publish this work? I would like to, I, uh, I guess secretly hope that there'll be like a three part series almost. Uh, so um, the first one would be uh, you know, developing the toolkit. Uh, the second would be kind of future plans uh, for, through a pilot project and then using the, the model for improvement uh, to have the iterative process and um, show that it does have an impact on safety culture and utilizing. So most uh, organizations, including UC Davis, have uh, safety culture assessments that they do annually. And then so there's already baseline data uh, that's out there showing kind of the gap in the safety culture. And then so then you can follow it up uh, after we have your implementation and then show improvements in your safety culture with subsequent assessments. And so that'd be part two. <laughs> Sounds like a career, Eric. Yeah, Great I, work. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Jana Glines Harvey. And Jana's thesis is entitled Unexplained Healings, a Concept Analysis. And uh, I was Jana's thesis chair. Jana, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Bakurjian. Um, I'm so excited to share with you about unexplained healings. 
I've always been interested in unexplained healings, and after preliminary research, I was baffled that there was no congruent understanding of the phenomenon. And as a nurse, I wondered how this applied to patient care. The healthcare community is trained to care for a patient's body and mind, and yet often feels unprepared to address a patient's desire or experience with an unexplained healing. The data shows that new unexplained healings are reported annually about 20 times, and then one out of every 60 to 100,000 cancer remissions are designated as unexplained. But these events receive little attention, and they're described with a kaleidoscope of terminologies and definitions. And without a cohesive understanding, forward movement with patient care is prevented. I sought to identify a concept of unexplained healing um, for the optimization of patient care. So through a literature review, I searched both scientific and gray literature to cast a wide net to include a variety of data mediums such as research studies, case studies, bibliographies, reference lists, among others, of interest to qualitative studies. Um, they chose to define unexplained healings divergently. Frankel et al. favored the phrase exceptional patient, whereas Turner coined the phrase radical remission. So one focused on the event and one focused on the patient. Jenna, and then I'm for the method, uh, just for yeah, can you share your screen um, so we can see your slides? Click down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Click down at the bottom and says share share your screen. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Are you able to see that? We are, thank you. Okay, thank you. Should I keep going from here? Yes. Okay. Um, so the, um, the method was a systematic tool called a concept analysis, and it was developed by Walker and Avant, and it was used to organize the data to aid in phenomenon identification, um, and then a concept map was generated to display the results. So to conduct the concept analysis, uh, the concept was selected and then the purpose was determined. The use of the concept was reviewed. The attributes or most repeated characteristics were categorized. A model case was selected as an ideal example. Related and unrelated cases were designated for the benefit of compare and contrast. Antecedents, which are events precipitating the concept, were selected, and then the consequences, which are events present after the concept, were noted. And then finally, empirical reference. These either confirm the attributes or they are the attributes. And the purpose was to direct, to direct the application of funding. So the results indicated that the definition of an unexplained healing, it is a biological occurrence without a natural explanation. And the terms that are attributes of an unexplained healing are heal, remarkable, spontaneous, unexplained, and miracle. And then conversely, an unexplained healing is not confirmation bias or that which is explainable. And if you'll allow me, in the center of our concept map, in orange is our concept and below in black is our definition. There are other elements which are part of the concept analysis and there are black arrows which indicate a relationship. So starting in the blue are the attributes and there's a relationship between the attributes, the event, definition, and antecedents. In the pink are the antecedents they relate to the attributes, definition, and consequences. And then in the green are the consequences. Their relationship is with the antecedents. The purple are empirical reference. And in this case, you may notice that they are the same as the attributes. And they are related to the attributes and the definition. Q 
two noteworthy facts that I discovered are clinicians are uniquely positioned to benefit patients by reporting legitimate cases to further understanding. And when an unexplained healing presents, the most important consideration for the healthcare community is not necessarily the definition of a concept, but the voice of the individual patient through questions like, what do you think happened? And in conclusion, validating patients' desires and experiences, like in so many other aspects of healthcare, is paramount. And albeit rare, the phenomenon could happen to any of us. Thank you for listening. All right, Jana, thank you so much for your presentation. This is really fantastic work. Um, I wanted to, to um, see if you would talk a little bit more about what it was like to do a concept analysis. It's very unusual for a master's thesis to do a concept analysis. So can you talk about what that experience was like for you? Yeah, I really enjoyed doing a concept analysis. Um, it was unique in that I um, felt like a pioneer um, because um, I, um, I was told that a concept analysis had not been done at this school before. And so um, it really, um, it, it felt novel and um, it was exciting. So I'm very thankful for uh, the guidance that I received. Um, I, um, I think it was unique in that it has its basis in philosophy. So it didn't start out necessarily um, with a basis in just research alone or in nursing. So it kind of um, was able to harmonize a lot of different disciplines. And that was a unique experience for me. So um, Jana, I wanted to follow up with that. Um, what kind of recommendations would you have for nurses uh, who who uh, have patients who have these experiences? How do we help, help our patients with this? Thank you for your question, Dr. Bakurjian. Um, I, I, what I learned from the data that, um, that patients seem to say, um, patients are people, people like you, people like me. And uh, we're, we're human at baseline and it comes down to dignity and respect. And so um, really it comes down to um, what the patient's experience, their lived experience, what they've been through in their life, um, what they're hoping for, what they're thinking is going to happen, what they think may have happened. And so I, I think I've learned that the, the critical heart of an unexplained healing and then there's a lot of no, novel research going on to figure out like these 20 cases of a year, like what are they, what's really going on and um, how can we harness that to benefit mankind? So I think it's a complex question that you're asking, but it's a beautiful question too. All right, Jana, thank you so much. What a great job. Please make sure that you um, stop sharing your slide so uh, we can have our next speaker um, share their slides. So um, our next speaker is Tia Kadu. Tia will be speaking on lifting the caregiving burden through e-health interventions and integrated review. And Tia's thesis chair was Dr. Taeyoon Kim. Tia? Hi, thank you, Dr. Bakurjian. It was mid-December 2018 when I called my aunt to let her know that I would be going over for a visit. You do well, she said, because grandma doesn't look good. I said, can you tell me more? And she said, 
uh, well, her heart's beating really fast. Her diastolic is in the 80s and she's not reacting. I'll be there in five, I said. But as I hung up the phone, I began to shake internally and I remember feeling numb as I drove to her house, did a neuro assessment and called 911 to say, I think my grandmother has just had a stroke. Throughout that day and the rest of the hospital stay, clinicians bombarded me with questions I didn't have the answers to. I made treatment and end of life decisions and communicated and coordinated with worried family members. In the midst of it all, I remember thinking, I am a trained clinician and I am having the hardest time managing my grief. I cannot imagine how frightening this might be for someone like my aunt who doesn't have the clinical background or speaks English very well. Yet many caregivers of persons with dementia experience such burden to varying degrees. Although they prefer to care for their loved ones at home, they may lack the intrinsic and the extrinsic resources to do so appropriately. And this leads to, to mental and um, physical health problems. Previously, providing education um, to caregivers at home and mental health support has uh, proved to be effective in improving their, their self-efficacy, the ability to successfully complete a task, and their psychological health. Yet, with the growing dementia population um, expected to rise to 13 million by 2050, and with a shrinking pool of geriatric specialists, um, these these types of support are becoming less and less feasible. Alternatively, e-health interventions, delivering healthcare services via the internet may be able to um, efficiently complement care because they decrease the waiting period times in clinics, they save driving time, and they enable the ability to reach caregivers that live in remote areas. However, it's important that if we are to develop these interventions, they are caregiver and care recipient centered, meaning they address their preferences and um, they apply to the context of care. A few reviews had looked at the effectiveness of e-health interventions. However, um, only a few of, none of them actually had addressed the characteristics of e-health interventions. Um, that contribute to decreasing the caregiven burden. So in my integrated review, um, as part of my thesis project, I completed, I looked at 13 studies, nine of which were randomized control, control trials, um, and did a thematic analysis of the characteristics of e-health interventions, those being the type of education content included, um, the delivery method, so was it email, online forums, or video conference, and what type of support was offered through the e-health interventions, clinical or um, informal from other caregivers. And I also looked at the, how the care, these characteristics um, helped in improving caregiving burden, self-efficacy, quality of life, stress, anxiety, and depression. And the main point that came from the research was that e-health interventions that used video conference to connect caregivers with other healthcare providers, um, they were most effective in improving caregiving burden, self-efficacy, and quality of life. Um, improving anxiety and depression required that these interventions lasted at least six months. So um, the findings suggest that e-health interventions that incorporate various methods of interaction with caregivers and healthcare providers may be um, an effective way to decrease caregiver burden. Despite my extensive research, however, only three interventions included video conference, indicating that such research is still as it, at its infancy. However, as evidence with the COVID-19 pandemic um, that we are all experiencing, there is a growing need for such interventions and um, that's not limited just to dementia caregivers. So future research can support their advancement by developing and testing e-health interventions that utilize video conferencing as a means of connection with healthcare providers and caregivers. They should also look at how characteristics of e-health interventions improve utilization 
and determine what the cost effectiveness of e-health interventions is. Such research can then advance the development of government supported policies that, that offer reimbursement for preventive care offered through e-health. Um, finally, healthcare organizations can, can, uh, can begin to shift the organizational culture to be more accepting of e-health interventions through clinical education, as well as fostering interprofessional collaboration. Um, and in this way, we can all um, try to complement usual care with e-health interventions, decrease caregiving burden for dementia caregivers and other caregivers, and hopefully improve population health. Thank, Thank you. you, Tia. Fantastic. What a wonderful presentation on this really important topic. And thank you so much for sharing your, your personal story as well. Um, do you have some thoughts about how you might follow up on this work to build towards some of the things that you talked about? <laughs> You're putting me on the spot, Dr. Brigitte. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I hope to continue the work. Um, I would like to focus on utilization and um, see cost effectiveness probably, but I think that's a bigger project. But I definitely think that these interventions, even though they're available or they're becoming more available um, at UC Davis, I. Uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the uh, Department of Psychiatry is reaching out to caregivers now through telehealth. Um, so they are becoming more available. However, there, we don't know whether there is barriers from the caregiver's perspective. So um, is there, in, is there um, internet access? Uh, do they have the, the computer literacy um, to use these interventions, what kind of barriers are they, are they experiencing? So I would like to focus more on utilization of e-health interventions. Um, that's my next step and hopefully through, you know, through continuing my research um, here at Betty Irene. <laughs> Fantastic. So let me just ask one other thing. You talked a lot about policy changes and that seems like this would really be a critical piece what about education? What can we as educators do uh, to help bring this issue to light? Thank you for um, asking that question. I think I, I didn't ask, I didn't state that in my, it was my last sentence, but I think Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing is already doing, um, prepping their um, PA and NP students in the curriculum to, or entering in the curriculum preparations on how to assess and how to monitor patients with telehealth. And I think we're ahead of the game um, on that aspect. But I think other nursing schools should also include such methods in their curriculums and start teaching students or nursing students um, to care via telehealth. Very good. Thank you so much, Tia. Wonderful thank presentation. You. Thank you for this opportunity. And if I can thank my chair, Dr. Taeyoung Kim, and my committee, um, Dr. Susan Adams and Dr. Fawn Cothran and my um, MSL cohort. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's move on to our next speaker, Sal Mislang. Sal will be presenting his thesis topic, I Need Handoff, Empowering Inpatient RNs During Patient Handoffs from Emergency Department RNs. Sal's uh, thesis chair is Dr. Jan Marie Garcia. Out. Can you guys see that? Thank you, Dr. Bakurjian. Uh, just make sure did the slide so slide show pop there. Okay. Sorry. So, like Dr. Bakurjian was alluding to, I um, decided to focus on uh, acute care with my thesis, and it was a quality improvement project. And um, uh, I was primarily interested in patient handoffs. So what a patient handoff is, it's a transfer of patient information, usually from a sending RN to a receiving RN. And what that does, it, it kind of communicates to the nurse that is going to be taking over the patient what is critical to look for in order to safely um, receive this patient. Um, typically, uh, from what the studies are showing, um, patients go through about 
24, 25 on average handoffs while they're in the hospital. And that is a handoff usually, you know, during shift, between shift changes or when levels of care change. What I was primarily interested in is looking at the transition that the, the patient goes from the ER where they're most critical to when they're beginning, when they're getting admitted into the inpatient setting. And the reason why that is, is uh, one, I work in an environment where we only take patients from the ER and that handoff that we normally get um, isn't the most um, succinct or uh, complete. And it makes sense because the ER, again, the environment that the ER nurses deal with is usually pretty stressful and chaotic. And the, the movement of patients from nurse to nurse in the ER happens um, frequently that sometimes the ER doesn't know what's going on really with the patient when they're getting admitted or once they're getting admitted. And when that happens, there's lapses in communication from the ER to the inpatient setting, and that creates delays in patient care. And some of the solutions uh, that I found were standardizing, um, this handoff process and the standardization usually involves either uh, uh, standardizing policies or creating tools that can kind of help um, make this transition more efficient. So I did a literature review and there actually is a lot of um, studies looking at handoffs, but unfortunately not a lot that focus on the ED to the uh, inpatient set setting. I found about five or six that kind of looked at that. And what I found were the common themes where they uh, whenever they were creating uh, this handoff protocol, they would always get input from the receiving RN so that those are the information that they would include into the um, whatever policy or procedure they were implementing. They also um, employ the use of a handoff tool or a checklist tool that will help um, both nurses kind of communicate what is important um, in terms of taking care of the patient. And in order to evaluate the tool, they would um, at the end use uh, some sort of survey or um, a focus group to kind of gauge whether this process or protocol that they develop um, met the needs of the RNs that are involved in that transition. Uh, again, some of the gaps I found were one, the role of the receiving RN is although they're getting input from the receiving RN, a lot of what they what was to be executed in the protocol was placed on the ER nurse. So um, when they would create this tool, they would expect the ER nurse to kind of complete it so that um, again, that to complete it to facilitate this transition. And as we all know, the ER nurses don't have time for that. And another one was a, uh, again, limited studies that were focusing on the ED to inpatient handoff. So what I wanted to do was, um, because I worked, I was able to, uh, I work in an environment where we only get patients from the ER, I identified my unit as kind of a setting to where I can implement this quality improvement project. And from the literature, I wanted, um, to implement a tool that the inpatient receiving RNs would use to kind of help um, trigger or ask, ask questions to the ED RNs during this handoff so that they can kind of uh, facilitate this safe transition of care. So the first thing I needed to do was to create a tool and I, I based my I need handoff tool. It's kind of a mnemonic based off of uh, what was out in the literature was an IPASS handoff. Uh, which is uh, a tool that pediatric doctors use when they're giving report um, uh, to each other. And I chose it because it was very succinct and very short so that hopefully when the inpatient RNs would um, question or ask EDRNs, the EDRNs questions, uh, they would be able to answer these uh, fairly quickly. And it's usually uh, something that should be generally known about the patient. And so the IPASS, just the mnemonic of it is right, it's off here to the right. It's the patient's illness severity, a little quick summary of the patient, any action lists or things that need to be done once the patient arrives on the floor. Th uh, situation awareness, so things that you should be looking out for for the patient. And it also uh, had a synthesis portion, which allowed the receiver to kind of, uh, kind of repeat everything uh, and uh, ask questions if, if, if needed to the, the, the nurse giving report. Um, so what I created was the I need handoff, which was uh, based off of this and some input from some of my floor charge nurses. And this is kind of what it looked like. It was a paper tool and we chose a paper portion of it because it uh, was easy to access for the nurses uh, uh, immediately instead of having to log in and try and uh, log into some sort of EMR um, script. But they would just grab the sheet and once they're getting a report, they would ask quick questions uh, if the ER nurse would call. Basically quick information of the patient, um, what their neuro status was, are, are they ANO times one, two, three, four, can they walk? Any emergent data or uh, things that we need to know, any things uh, that we need to do in terms of expected tasks, like do we need to hang more antibiotics or, um, give another unit of blood, and then the patient's disposition. Are we admitting them to uh, 
uh, OBS uh, 24 hour care or they're here more long term ish. So that was kind of the initial tool that we had. And the second phase of it, I wanted to do a PDSA cycle to kind of test to, to see whether this tool um, was kind of sufficient for the process. And <clears throat> I recruited my, uh, on that floor that I work on, I recruited my relief charge nurses to use it uh, for a two week trial period. And after that, we did electronic surveys um, to evaluate the effectiveness of the tool, um, whether the tool's contents were sufficient for patient care, and whether these nurses would use it again um, for the process. So 19 charge nurses were recruited, uh, 14 responded. Um, of the 14, 11 agreed that the tool um, sought for the adequate patient information that they needed to care for the patient. Um, 10 of the RNs that responded agreed that this tool improved the handoff process and nine of them agreed that they would use again. Um, some of the feedback that I got was, even though we had this tool, still some of the EDRNs couldn't answer a majority of the questions that we had there. And, uh, and a side note too, I, we didn't uh, let the ER nurses know that we were implementing this tool. So they, it was more on the inpatient side and they would just ask these questions sort of as a template or a script. And they also gave some feedback to improve the layout of the tool, which kind of made it more, again, more specific to what South One needed, uh, which is the unit that um, just receives patients from the ER. So this kind of was the finalized tool um, that I had created and was hoping to implement, but COVID happened. So we, didn't, we weren't able to um, Im implement it yet. And again, some of the limitations for my studies was that it's again, specific to just my unit. Obviously each unit that receives patients from the ERs have different um, uh, or request different information in order to safely take care of a patient. But it does show that any sort of standardization, whether it's a tool or um, any process changes or um, policies uh, can kind of help improve the efficiency of the handoff um, process in general for patients. And that's what I have. And I want to say thank you to all the people that are on here and couldn't have done this without you all. And yeah, thanks. All right, Sal, thank you so much. This was great. Of course, you know, I love it because it was QI. Yep. Fantastic. Um, using the PDSA cycles, wonderful. Um, I'm curious whether you think will you be able to take, you know, go on to some of your planned next steps after COVID settles down? Is that what you're thinking for next steps? Yes, we were actually, so this was kind of in collaboration with our manager. We're actually planning to use this tool to kind of help um, improve this uh, transition from the ER to our inpatient setting. So I'm hoping to, if I, once I get to talk to her to kind of um, uh, create this tool again and have it laid out and, and do a more formal, not necessarily training, but more, uh, more of a kind of like an in-service to our nurses to kind of use this tool to kind of help improve uh, their their um, their receiving of information from the ER nurses, yeah. so that is the plan to continue with it. Um, so uh, there's a question about whether or not you would work with the ER so that they would um, actually know and be prepared to respond appropriately. Yes, that's a great question actually, and that's something that I've been kind of mulling on because uh, the information that we have on this tool is very specific to our unit and I and trying to work with the ER, I think would be great, but trying to uh, get them to, um, how do I put this? The information that they give to us isn't necessarily gonna be the same the information that they're gonna give to say another unit, like a trauma unit or whatnot. So it might be very difficult to ask them to say, hey, this is what we're doing. Can you do this for us? Versus when uh, they're calling report to another unit and they're trying to go off that tool, it may be, the requirements that they need will be uh, different. So I know there's gonna be a lot of collaboration, I feel, um, with them to create something more standard. Um, so, cause I think what happened was I kind of went down this rabbit hole where it, it kind of become more became more focused to South One and not necessarily to the inpatient setting in general. So um, I would love to definitely work with them and pick their brains in terms of how we can um, help just improve the patient handoff process in general. Yeah, and it seems like this would be a great collaboration too if you have any kind of a quality and safety committee or Correct. quality and safety champions, right? Yes. Uh, that they could be really helpful in spreading the um, spreading it out to other units. Correct. All right, fantastic. So um, let's go on to our next speaker, uh, Matthew Vega, who will be speaking to us about improving nursing knowledge and attitudes of, of transgender patients. Matthew's thesis chair is Dr. Elena Siegel. Matthew? Hi, thank you, Dr. Barkerjian. Uh, let's see, share.
All right, is that sharing correctly? Yes. Um, okay. Actually, no, we're not seeing the um, uh, show view. We're seeing, so uh, put it on. Share. If you, you know, if you, if you um, go down to the very bottom right and put, um, click on the uh, full show vision view, where it says slideshow, the, the oh, okay. over to your right a little further slideshow, the last one, the last little icon. Perfect. Okay. Oh. And okay. now we're actually seeing your, you must have two screens in front of you, Matthew. I do, so that's why I'm trying <laughs> to figure out what's working. Okay, let's look at your other screen. So sometimes it helps if you share your second screen. So click on your share screen again down at the bottom, or stop sharing for, I'm sorry, stop sharing first, and then click on your share screen, and then this time click your other screen. Okay. So that we can see the full sh uh, slideshow. It should come up as an option for you to share your second screen. There we go. Perfect. Oops, sorry. Oh. All right. Excellent. Okay, great. Sorry. that. All right. Well, thank you again. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Vega, and I will be presenting the culmination of my year-long dive back into academia. Uh, the title is Improving Care for Transgender Patients and Education for Nurses. So I want to start off by saying that I really wanted to make something that was dear to my heart and something that could be used to improve nursing in some way. So I looked to what got me into healthcare in the first place. Years ago, I volunteered at an AIDS hospice that cared for mostly LGBT patients. And I remember one of the clients, she was a transgender woman who was kind, strong, and an incredible person. The staff there took impeccable care of her. The care was compassionate, high quality, and respectful. And in my more naive and younger mind, I felt that this care would be similar everywhere. But she told me that the care here was exceptional, but it was also the exception. So growing in my nursing career, I began to understand what she was talking about. I saw how healthcare was full of health disparities and barriers for transgender people. Here is a highlight of a few major ones, and I want to take note of these because these numbers are alarmingly high, especially when talking about mental health and suicide rates. Other stats show that because of the negative healthcare experiences, they delay care and do not disclose that they are transgender, which lead to poor health outcomes. I wanted to focus on ways that we as nurses can improve these outcomes to reduce these barriers. And so I turned to the literature. The literature showed that incorporating cultural competency training and population inclusive and specific education was effective at reducing barriers to healthcare. While there are wonderful cultural competency trainings that exist, I found little to no transgender specific health education geared towards training nurses on how to provide quality care for this population. In fact, I found a systemic problem regarding nursing and transgender education, training, and research. What we have from our profession is very sparse. And so I found that this was something I could really focus on, an education that helps nurses provide quality care to their transgender patients. And I just wanna take a moment to just encourage nurses out there to do this research and create more education about transgender health because there's a lot that still needs to be done. So in order to create content for an education for nurses, I had to summarize, synthesize, and frame information from the standards of care created by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health Multiple, multiple highly regarded online education modules on transgender health, and then scope it within the practice and duties of nurses. What came from this was a 45 minute PowerPoint presentation with an additional 15 minutes set aside for discussion and case study, complete with scripts. There's a major focus on demystifying the role of the RN regarding transgender care, as well as how to apply this, uh, the nursing process to this, to this care. The education focuses on giving a high level overview and possibly a first time look at many different surgical procedures, hormone treatments and resources out there that are important for transgender care. 
overall, there were four main learning objectives. Um, they were to differentiate between terminology about sex, identity, and gender, acknowledge the many health risks and disparities high within the transgender populations, recognize many different and necessary surgical and non-surgical gender affirming treatments, and to articulate the RN's role in caring for transgender patients with gender affirming care. To make sure that this presentation was high quality and useful, it is being systematically reviewed by a panel of experts, including educators, nurses, and transgender people. Their critiques and inputs will be used to revise the presentation with the goal of using this to help educate staff nurses as well as student nurses so that they can provide quality care to their transgender patients. Possibilities for the future would be to, to develop more unit specific educations as well as curriculum for nursing schools. And that's it, thank you. I wanna thank my thesis chair, Dr. Siegel, my committee, Dr. Adams and Dr. Rice, um, UC Davis, Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, faculty, friends, classmates, and my loving family. Questions? Yes, thank you, Matthew. Wow, what a you know heartwarming and yet at the same time heartbreaking story about um, your experiences um, and what an enlightening presentation on a topic that's really important and timely. Um, I'm gonna put you on the spot just like I did everyone else. Okay. And I wanna ask you about, um, given the fact that there's, so, there's such a lack of knowledge around um, your topic, how will you further expand this work? I know you talked about some ideas that you have, but it takes really specific steps. So have you thought about what purposeful things that you were going to do to get this really great work out there? Well, this was gonna be hopefully the first step in a long journey, um, eventually maybe get a doctorate. But like, again, like this is a first steps. The big huge goal would be to actually do a survey of like a hospital system um, to see what people's attitudes and knowledge were um, to just kind of highlight that there is a gap. And then to have tools like this as educations that could be used to help uh, improve the knowledge. Um, so developing this education, using this as maybe like a starting point and then creating more units specific with more in-depth information uh, regarding transgender care for like maybe the MSU, um, for post-surgical units, or even like outpatient clinics because primary care is where most people get their care. Yes, and I will of course encourage you as I've challenged um, other students to publish your work. I could see this being a wonderful continuing education module in one of the main um, nursing journals. So I hope you think about that. Um, <clears throat> Including another um, question, including transgender people in the review is an excellent, sorry, is an excellent idea. Do you know where you are going to find that resource? The resource of transgender people? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, like I know some transgender educators. Um, I know some, I have some transgender friends that I can talk to, um, but for this, specifically panel, I try to use people that weren't like, you know, people that I know outside of like uh, work. Mm -hmm. um, so like they have people, um, I'm skip, like I'm blanking on the name, uh, but there are people that do, uh, do transgender educations that uh, new employee orientation. And I use some of those people to look over this. Great. Well, this is very worthwhile work, Matthew. And I, again, I hope you publish it. It just seems like it's gonna um, be very important for us. All right, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so our next uh, group of students will be presenting posters on their um, uh, group projects uh, from Dr. Amy Nichols course, Research Quality Improvement and Evidence-Based Practice. During this course, students from the master's entry program in nursing partner with students from our physician assistant and nurse practitioner programs, working together in groups to identify and research the evidence on a particular problem, develop a potential intervention for that problem, compare or contrast uh, potential interventions or data in order to get to a desired outcome. 
Our first presenter is Carrie Garland, who will be presenting her group's poster, The Effective Payment Methods on Suboxone Therapy. Carrie will be sharing the names of her colleagues who worked on the project with her. Carrie? All right, let me get this shared. There we go. All right, so as Dr. Deborah Kurjian said, um, my name is Carrie Garland, and as of today, I have graduated as family nurse practitioner, so I'm excited. Um, working with me on this project, I had Sarah Choi, uh, Taylor Hammerning, Michelle Kimball, Katie Pushad, uh, Janie Pudwell, and Silu Vargas. So our project was a literature review. We were looking at opioid addicted persons who are seeking suboxone therapy and how the type of payment method can affect their adherence to therapy. Um, as we know, there's a current opiate crisis in the United States and the CDC reports that 47,000 people um, die of overdose deaths um, in 2017. So this is a large issue. So medication assisted treatment or MAT programs such as suboxone have been proven to be an effective method for treating opiate addiction. Um, so my classmates noted during their clinical rotations that their clinics they would go to only accept a cash payment and that they stated that people were more adherent to their suboxone therapy when they paid for it with cash. Uh, we wanted to know if this was true, so we went looking through the research um, to see how um, payment methods affected adherence. What we found is that this is a pretty novel subject and there just isn't much research out there on it. Um, however, the papers that we were able to find that did publish um, did cooperate with this theory that patients do have better adherence when they're paying cash for suboxone treatment. Um, we found one large study, it had over 27,000 um, people and it covered throughout the United States. And uh, so my results are shown in the middle of the presentation there. And so it found that um, for cash pay people, six months later, 60%, about 60% of them were still um, adherent to their therapy. Whereas if someone was in a third party insurance, only about 33% of them were adherent six months later. And the worst was with Medicare and Medicaid, where only about 22% of them were adherent to their therapy six months later. Um, other smaller studies that we found in articles, um, both all agreed that cash pay had the best adherence and that Medicare and Medicaid were overwhelmingly the worst. Um, so we are wondering why this might be. So it seems that there are several factors that lead people into cash payment. Um, thus only people who have cash can continue with the therapy. So we found many ideas of why this might be true, but a couple of examples that we found were, um, you know, I'll list them here. So studies have proven that MAT therapy works best when it's combined with behavioral therapy. So we found that clinicians would have people pay, um, bulk pay upfront for their medication as well as behavioral therapy because they found that people were more likely to go and do it if they'd already paid for it. So obviously insurance won't cover this and it has to be a cash payment. Another example is that Medicaid will cover the cost of the suboxone pills, um, but it, individuals have to pay cash for any non-covered office visits to regularly get the prescription to begin with from their physicians. Um, some insurances, um, they have lifetime limits for how much suboxone they will pay for, which will limit what people can do with their insurance. So in the end, um, considering the drastically improved adherence for individuals with self-pay versus those with insurance, we feel it's important for future studies to investigate the underlying reasons and to see why this correlation actually exists. If we could incorporate some of these ideas into insurance plans, it could help improve adherence overall and thus help save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Wonderful job. Um, <clears throat> this is such a timely topic as well. Um, and in looking over your poster earlier, I noticed that you um, there's a part here that you talked, you kind of hypothesized that social determinants of health were important in this population. And I'm wondering if in your research you found information about um, specifically what types of social determinants were most relevant to adherence? So it wasn't anything. So the reason we were, we were you know, hypothesizing about that is because we were just looking at the demographics and the demographics for the people who were giving the option of Suboxone were young, white um, individuals, you know, who tend to be in the higher economic social factors. Uh, some people were saying that if someone came in with Medicaid or Medicare, they just, 
or especially Medicaid, they just didn't even offer Suboxone in the first place. So there was really no way to see like, you know, so we're just hypothesizing that the people who tend to be of a, you know, poor socioeconomic class tend to be those who are in Medicaid or Medicare, um, you know, and who are not white, young, um, you know, fairly healthy individuals. And so, you know, more research has to be done into that, but a lot of it was people just excluded them from the first place, so we couldn't even look at it. So they're not even getting the benefit of the therapy. Yeah. So as you know, we do a comprehensive simulation on MAT in the NPPA program. And how would you suggest that we um, uh, uh, change our education or address more uh, related to this topic uh, as part of that, that program? So I think the problem is more of like the systemic type issues. I think, um, cause what we are finding is like a lot of it has to be the behavioral health that goes with it, making sure people are ready to accept this. Um, cause the pill itself isn't going to fix the issue. It's, you know, people can get the pill. Um, it's the problem is, can they pay for the office visits? Cause you have to, as a schedule two medication, you have to regularly get office visits. You know, do people have the ability to get to the office to do these in-person visits to then get their prescription? Do they have, um, you know, the wherewithal to do the behavioral health therapy type stuff? Do they have, um, you know, telehealth might help this in the future, um, but before it always had to be in-person. So like, how can they get transportation to go do, you know, the behavioral health part of it to make it so that they can get through and finish this? And then part of it also is that, you know, um, just anecdotally, because we were doing an interview of um, Dr. Vargas, uh, who is actually prescribing these, is she said that people had to be ready to do this. And so if they're willing to pay cash, then they're ready to do it versus if it was insurance, a lot of times it was family members who were pushing them into doing it. And they're like, oh, to make you happy, I'll start taking this, but they weren't really motivated to continue on and do this. All really good points that I think we're gonna have to work into our simulation. So thank you very much um, for presenting your team's work. It seems uh, very, very useful. And as I said, timely. Thank you. All right, let's move on to our next speaker. I'd like to introduce Melissa Kamnunset, who will speak about her team's project, Evaluating Treatments of Adolescents Major Depressive Disorder. And again, Melissa will share her teammates when she um, gets started. Melissa? Hi everyone. <laughs> um, so my name is Melissa and I will be presenting my group's poster, Evaluating Treatments of Adolescent Major Depressive Disorder. My teammates include Haley DeGroad, Audrey LaFro, Sapri Naidu, Tom Pham, Dylan Scalzo, and Paulina Remeister. Our PICO question for our literature review was, in adolescents diagnosed with major depressive disorder, how does cognitive behavioral therapy compared to SSRI drug therapy or combination therapy affect treatment outcomes. So some definition and de definitions and our goals. Major depressive disorder is prolonged depression consisting of a loss of interest or pleasure along with four or more diagnosis, diagnosing symptoms. Cognitive behavior therapy is a type of therapy that challenges negative thought patterns about the self and world to create cognitive changes and reframe mindsets. And the SSRI therapy is the common drug therapy used for MVD. In the middle here, we have um, our evidence and methods. Basically what we found from our evaluation was that our findings aligned with, or our um, findings aligned with much of the existing research where CBT was the most effective. We also found that um, there was little difference between SSRI and CBT monotherapy, and that CBT is a great addition for those who do not have success with SSRI treatments or are likely to relapse. Some of the implications that we figured out were um, that for adolescents who are reluctant for, to try drug therapy, 
due to the adverse side effects, cognitive behavioral therapy is, equal, is an equally viable option as a non-pharmacological treatment. And integrating combination therapy can help reduce suicidality and drug abuse in susceptible populations. And at the end of the day, even though our research um, concludes that the combination therapy is more successful, we have to remember that treatment plans must be specific to the patient's needs. And one way to cope with this is to involve the patient in the treatment plan and have them set their own goals and pace for their healing. And lastly, um, I'm sure many people know that combination therapy is the best way to go. It's, you know, sky's blue, water's wet. Um, however, our findings and our study was, is a great reminder of what works. So with everything going on in the world, we may find that more adolescents actually need more support um, due to the stressors of the pandemic and social justice movements going on um, that really affect their personal lives. So um, figuring out what types of treatments would work for these adolescents who are more effective um, is, will be really important in the upcoming future. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Amy Nichols and our TA, Michaela Davis, for putting on a wonderful class last fall. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Melissa, for presenting this really important topic um, in the adolescent population, uh, who, who at times can be quite challenging, right? Because mm -hmm. they're at that, that age, we say. We often say they're at that age. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So um, can you say a little bit more about um, what cognitive behavioral therapy entails for this, the, the, this age group? I'm, I'm thinking particularly in the um, light of, you know, these individuals are part of a family. Often parents have some kind of influence. Um, did you read anything about that in your review? Yeah, we read a little bit about that. Um... So oftentimes cognitive behavioral therapy, um, a lot of it is like, you know, obviously you're talking about your feelings and what's going on with the therapist, but there's also a lot of activities that you can do. Um, so there's like a couple of worksheets and um, just like, for example, like you listing out all the things that are bothering you and then you go through it with the therapist and um, kind of starts, thinking like, okay, here are all these negative things that you've listed out. How can we, how can we reframe these things into a more positive light and practice that throughout the day and weeks so that when you're thinking of things like, oh, I'm really terrible at school or like, oh, nobody likes me, um, talking yourself out of that um, and practicing that is one way um, cognitive behavioral therapy works. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned also, um, oh, yes. oh, I was going to say you mentioned also involving the parents. Um, and I think um, with involving parents, it's super important because a lot of the times, a lot of the issues that many adolescents may face may be in the home. So I think that's actually one of the barriers to um, retreat, um, receiving care because some parents may not be willing to be involved with uh, their child's care. So it's something to think about. Yeah, that's, that's really challenging when there's that kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Melissa, again, for presenting this important work. Um, great job. Thank you so much. All right, so we're going to move on to our last but not least speaker in this session. Uh, Wendy Luke will be presenting um, their project, The Efficacy of Mindfulness in Reducing Anxiety. And again, Wendy will also share the names of her colleagues who worked on the project. Hi, everyone. Are you able to see uh, the poster all right? Yes, we can see it, Wendy. Thank you. Awesome. So hi everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Wendy Luke. I had the opportunity and privilege to work with my fellow colleagues, Mary Cooper, Colleen Esposito, Brianne Samuelson, Sydney Soule,
David Wilson, and Su Yi Lung, Young, Su Young Lee on this evidence-based research. We all know that anxiety is one of the most prevalent mental illnesses in our society. Studies show that one in five adults are affected annually. My colleagues and I agree that there is still much to be done in providing the care for mental illness, specifically for generalized anxiety disorder. Although traditional pharmacological treatments such as benzodiazepines and SSRIs are effective in decreasing symptoms of anxiety, we felt that it failed to solve the root cause of the issue. There's a lot of evidence that cognitive behavioral therapy is effective. However, there are many barriers such as cost, insurance limitations, and the stigma with mental health. With mindfulness being a growing movement, we wanted to compare how a mindfulness practice um, would compare to traditional interventions in combating anxiety. With the help of our library personnel, we conducted an EBP review of 10 of the most relevant studies that met our criteria. We found that al although mindfulness alone is not significantly better than traditional treatments, it is still effective in improving symptoms of anxiety, reducing distress, and it also does have sustained beneficial effects by building resiliency. It is cost effective and accessible as there are many apps providing free mindfulness practices now. As healthcare providers, we can offer this as a resource for our patients as an adjunct therapy to treat anxiety holistically. We can also offer this to the inpatient setting as a productive activity to do as many, as, as many of our acute patients are worried in bed all day. Because of the long-term effects of a mindfulness practice, we thought that this would work best work upstream as a preventative measure to foster coping skills early on. And some of these ideas we came up with were to incorporate mindfulness in K through 12 school curriculum and a little bit closer to home to incorporate this in the curriculum of medical and nursing schools to help build resilience in combating future clinician burnout. It is almost guaranteed that anxiety will affect us at one point of in our lives. So I'd like to give you a little taste on your way out. Go ahead and lean back and close your eyes. Without changing anything, just bring your attention to your breath. Bring your awareness to the natural curves of your spine slight anterior tilts of the pelvis, transversus abdominis, your rib ring slowly rolls in, so your chest lifts up. Your sternum slides slightly forward, a slight extension of your thoracic spine. We root down to lift up. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Big breath out. Any lingering thoughts that you have, just smile, let them go, and return to your breath. Full breath in. Big breath out. Blink your eyes open and thank you very much. Okay, now I'm forced to come back to, to uh, say a few words, but it was very relaxing. Thank you so much, Wendy, for letting us experience mindfulness with you. Um, you actually, in reviewing your poster, I, I noticed that you listed some limitations in the studies that you included in the review. Do you have any um, thoughts or did your group have any thoughts about how a future study on mindfulness as a soul therapy could be put together? Yeah, I think it's a little bit difficult because if you have a randomized controlled study, it's very easy to see like, oh, I'm in it or I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, so um, within these studies, I think we could do a combination of like, this is a CBT only or a CBT within mindfulness incorporation. Mm -hmm. Maybe something like that would work, mm -hmm. um, but it's a little bit difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
comparing the two groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I just noticed that uh, I know that in just reading literature in general, mindfulness has just come um, such a long way in being noticed, right, as an important therapy, uh, not only for um, uh, patients per se who are experiencing anxiety, but also for um, clinical providers who are feeling burned out. Um, mm -hmm. Do any of your studies that you reviewed, Tom, uh, talk about clinicians or, you know, physicians or nurses or others um, in the use of mindfulness? So I, um, during this project, I didn't get to, uh, we didn't get to go into that route. However, I did do another research project on this. And it does say that it's very, um, it does help prevent clinician burnout. Um, a big barrier within that is that most hospital or facilities offer mindfulness once clinicians are actually working and to convince someone that like to take the time to actually do it at that point is mm -hmm. difficult. Um, but there are a lot of studies out there that says it does work. Um, kind of like uh, Melissa says, you know, the sky is blue. So are we going to do something about it? Right. <clears throat> Well, you've given us a great way that we um, that shown us how we can just integrate it into our our day, our daily uh, lives. So thank you so much for doing that. Absolutely. Thank you so much for letting me share. Of course. Well, this is the end of our academic symposium. Um, this was our fourth session and uh, our last one. I want to thank and congratulate all of the scholars who presented their exceptional work today. Uh, you all did a fantastic job. I certainly learned a lot about all the various topics and all of them were, I, I was impressed with how timely everything was and how um, hard that everybody worked on their, on their projects. I also wanna thank all of you who joined us for this last session of our academic symposium and hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.